Reformed Church. I, I do just want to start exactly where I left off last time. If you remember last time, I was reading from 2 Peter 2. Okay, um, in, in particular, 2 Peter 2, verse um, 18. 2 Peter 2, 18. And um, just because, you know, this is, we're sort of at the tail end of this series here, and I just wanted to point out the fact that uh, in 2 Peter 2, this is another one of those passages that people use for, um, they use for believers, um, when in fact it's referring to an unbeliever. And again, as we've been saying, I've been using the parable of the seed and the sower pretty much every single service because it really provides a good baseline of understanding for everything that we've been through. Actually, the parable of the seed and the sower was the first thing the Lord showed me um, um, regarding the fact that someone could legitimately receive the word and yet still not be saved. So that's why I always refer to the parable of the seed and the sower. So if you ever need clarification, pretty much every single point, almost every single point, um, that I've made, even through the whole series, can pretty much be verified by that parable. Because it does show you that someone can receive the word and yet fall away before they come to that point of fruit, and that point of fruit is their salvation. And, and the receiving of the seed, right, that's the receiving of the word of God, which means that they did believe, but they weren't saved yet. And the reason why it's so important, and this is very crucial, the reason why it's so important to understand that you can't not necessarily as here, but that one can believe and still not be saved if they don't have a full-grown faith or a full assurance of faith. The reason why that's so important is because there's numerous places in the Bible that refer to people that believe, and then they fall away, or people that were enlightened, and then they, they fall away and they can't be renewed again to repentance. Um, people that believed and then fell away, and the Bible speaks about the judgment that awaits that person in the last day or wrath that, that you know, awaits that person. And what people end up doing, if you don't realize that you can believe legitimately and still not be saved, then every time the Bible speaks about these people that are enlightened or that they believe to some extent, everyone always sees that as a Christian. And so that's where the doctrine comes from, that you can be a Christian and then still fall away and, and, and you know, come into judgment on the last day or something like that because they see, well, look, the person was enlightened. The person believed. And so they assume that everyone that is enlightened or believes is a Christian, and that's just not the case, right? So that's why it's so important to understand that you can believe and still not be saved. Because then when you see, like in Second Peter here, it says, um, it explains, this, there's a, it's a lot, of, uh, lot of words here, so I'm just going to try to hone in on certain points here. But it explains people that are deceivers and that allure people through the lust of the flesh and stuff. And it says that they allure people through much wantonness. It says, those that were clean escaped from those who live in error. You see, this right here, most people would say, well, look, it's talking about a kind of person that is clean escaped from those that live in error. And you would look at that and say, well, that has to be talking about a Christian, right? Who else has escaped the errors, the error, meaning obviously like the wrong thinking of this world, except a Christian? But again, we have to, let's go back to the parable of the seed and the sower. Um, how many people bore fruit or were saved in that parable? Only one kind of person. How many people actually believed and received the word? Three different types, actually, in the parable of the seed and the sower. And so there are two types of ground in that parable that actually escape those who live in error. In other words, they escape the error of the world by the knowledge of Jesus. That's why if you actually go to verse 20, it's still referring to the same kind of people, and it says, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world uh, through the knowledge of the Lord. Now, the word pollutions, to the best of my knowledge here, it is still referring to that error, because the, the pollution here just means defilement. This is not talking about that they have escaped the corruption that's in this world through lust, or that, or they're, that they're redeemed from the world yet. That's not what it's talking about. What it, the context of this chapter is that talking about people that have escaped what? Earlier, two verses earlier, it said escape. Um, the error that's in the world, and here it says they escape the pollutions of the world, which is referring to the error, to the best of my knowledge, just based off the, the, the two verses previous. And that, in, in further confirmation of this, it says they escape the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord uh, in our Savior Jesus Christ. So in other words, this is talking about a person that has the knowledge of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. They have that knowledge. But if you think that everyone that has the knowledge of Jesus is saved, that's where we get things like this, and we read this chapter, and we say, oh, look, this is talking about a saved person. You see, they have the knowledge of Jesus. But guess what? Uh, 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 three people in the parable of the seed and the sower had the knowledge of Jesus, too, and only one ever was saved. 
Why? Because only one continued to a full growth of faith. And uh, that's what we've been talking about this whole series, right? So this, this chapter is no exception. This is talking about a person that is not saved yet, but has escaped the error of the world, the world uh, by the knowledge of Jesus. But then it says, look, it says they're entangled again therein. You see? They are again entangled therein and are overcome. And their latter end, or the end thereof, is worse than the beginning. And all that we even explained last time is that this is talking about a kind of person that does receive the word at first, and then they, they fall away. They give up that word. But get, guess what? Doesn't this sound like the parable of the seed and the sower? They start out with the word of God, having escaped the incorrect belief of the word, of the world. Excuse me. Uh, they, they, they have escaped those that live in error, you could say, because they now have the knowledge of Jesus. Unlike the rest of the world, they have the knowledge of Jesus. But then it says they are again entangled therein. It sounds like the parable of the seed and the sower, right? It sounds like, uh, you know, thorns, the cares of this life, choking out the word. It sounds like persecution for the word's sake, you know, choking out the word, right? All these different tests and trials and things against the word of God that come. And sometimes people, even though they have the knowledge of Jesus, because they don't have a full growth of understanding yet, they're still children in their understanding, they can still be swayed from that knowledge. And there are some people that choose to be distracted by other things, and they will go off and forget what they initially heard, and that person never came to salvation. Now, this is particular, in particular uh, pointing out a kind of person that hears the word of God, isn't saved, right? But hears the word of God, gets distracted, goes on to other things, and does not return to the word of God. Okay, they don't, they don't ever like, come back to repentance. This is the kind of person here that's referring to. And that's why it says their latter end is worse than the beginning. Here's what we explained last time. Um, that for a per- I, won't, I won't dwell on this, but for a person that has received the word of God to some extent and then completely rejects it and says, nope, you know what, I don't want this actually, um, it, it would have been better if they would have never heard the word of God than to have heard it and then rejected it. And we went through that last time, right? Because the Bible does explain the fact that through, because of ignorance, even under the law, there, there are, God actually made cities of refuge, they're called. In the Old Testament, for people that committed some kind of crime against the law, but um, were ignorant. They, they didn't do it on purpose. And so God made these cities so that if you did something for instance, the Bible talks about like a man, if, it was, uh, if he was um, you know, chopping down a tree with an axe with his friend, and the axe head flies off the axe and hits the other man and kills the other man. Now, obviously, under the law, you, know, you shall not murder, right? So you can't kill another person under the law, but because he did it ignorantly, he didn't mean to do it. There are cities of refuge in, in the Bible. You can read about this in, um, I'll throw out the verse to you. Uh, it's a Joshua 20, um, verse 2, and also Deuteronomy 19.4. Joshua 22 and Deuteronomy 19.4 is the original quote. But it just talks about these cities of refuge. And if you do something ignorantly, you can flee to these cities of refuge. And because why? Because why did God make it have sort of like a caveat in the law for people that did something ignorantly? Because God doesn't hold people accountable for what they don't know or what they didn't do on purpose. That, that's not how it works. Like, so just, just to, just to uh, that right there, even things under the law right there should show you enough that it should sort of calm fears that sometimes we have. Well, what if, what if somebody doesn't have, you know, the opportunity, though, to know Jesus? Uh, God would not hold anyone accountable for anything that they didn't know or didn't do on purpose, okay? Uh, that, that is not, it's, it's just not the way it works. Now, no one on this earth has excuse because of the fact, just by creation, Right? People know that this came from somewhere, and therefore they know that there is a God that they should be trying to seek out. This God that they don't know, they should at least be trying to seek him out because they know he exists. Right? So no one has an excuse from that standpoint anyway. But there are people, though, that have more knowledge and less knowledge and uh, are more ignorant than others. Right? Everybody has opportunity, but some people have more opportunity than others. And for the people specifically that... Uh, have had less opportunity to receive the gospel. We explained last week that um, Jesus talks about this kind of person in in Luke 12. I won't read it just just right now. But um, that basically, um, even in the last day, even amongst people that are unsaved, um, 
when they come into the, the judgment of the devil and his angels, right? Because it's not their own punishment that's coming in the last day, but the devil and his angels. And when that judgment comes about, um, if someone is more so ignorant than another person, that person, Jesus, will actually spare them from some of the intensity of the torment of the devil and his angels. And I, I know this sounds all very, very, uh, you know, very, very, very harsh and very hard, but you, you have to listen to our teaching on judgment because this is really not their judgment. Um, and there's a lot more to this. Also, listen to the message, uh, the nations that are saved. I told that message a while ago, and that's a huge revelation that I, I've, I just, people are not teaching that today. So I, I understand that when I don't have the time to explain all of this, it, it definitely might sound harsh to somebody, but this is not their punishment. Jesus is not coming back to punish them, but even for the punishment that's not their own, that some people will come into of their own choosing, of their own choosing, okay, of their own choosing. Again, listen to the nations that are saved message for that. But of their own choosing. No one will go to the punishment of the devil and his angels in the last day without them choosing it. Okay? It may sound weird, but that is the case. And, um, uh, and so anyhow, even if they choose it in the last day, uh, if they are more so ignorant, though, and had less opportunity than some others, Jesus is actually able to spare them from some of the intensity of that punishment because of the fact that, you can just see how Jesus, especially in the nations that are saved message in, in particular, you can see how Jesus just looks for just ways to try to spare even unbelievers from the intentions of the devil um, in the last day. Uh, again, not, maybe a lot of this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to some people right now, but, um, but so if he sees that someone is more so ignorant, he can spare them from that because ignorance in the Bible is a just excuse from doing something wrong. All right? Ignorance in the Bible not knowing or not doing something purposefully or with intent is a just excuse in the Bible for wrongdoing. Okay? Um, it, it, it is an excuse. And so that's why God can spare them because he says, you know, I, I'm not going to hold you accountable for what you don't know. Right? That's why God didn't hold people accountable for their works before the law of works was given. Right? We were just talking about this. Um, right? Like so, people like Sodom and Gomorrah or Cain and Abel, people always think that that's punishment on sin, but that's not punishment on sin because it was before the law. Because why? God doesn't hold people accountable for what they don't know. He will never hold anyone accountable for it. So you don't have to worry about that. Like, oh, what if the person though didn't know and almost like slip? Nobody slips by accident into the punishment of the devil, devil and his angels in the last day. All this is made much clearer by our judgment message and also by the nations that are saved message online. All is made very clear. No one does it by accident, okay? It, it's God would not hold someone accountable for something they did by accident. Even, even under the law, even under the law of works, God didn't even hold people accountable for works that they did by accident. He actually made specifically, not only did God not hold them accountable, but what God did, he made cities of refuge so that even if the family of the person that you killed by accident were angry at you and wanted to kill you, he said, you know, you can come over here and hide and I'll protect you because I know that you did it on accident. So just so you know, God doesn't hold people accountable for something that they did ignorantly. Anyhow, um, this is talking about a kind of person, right, it, that, that, that does understand the, the knowledge of Jesus, but then rejects it. And that's why he says that it, it's actually worse. It's worse after that, that they've received the knowledge and then rejected it, than to have never known at all. Because if they had never known at all, God could have spared them from some judgment in the last day. But now that they've known and they know better and now rejected this, this knowledge willfully, now it's a problem because now God's like, well, now I can't spare you from anything. So either way, the person would have been judged, right? Everyone clear on this? The person would have come into judgment of the devil and his angels in the last day regardless, whether they completely rejected the gospel just out and out or this kind of person where they actually started growing in the knowledge of Jesus, escaped those who live in error and then reject it you're going to come into judgment either way. The reason why he's saying it's actually worse for this person is because now that you've known so much and been enlightened to the gospel so much and then have rejected it, now I have to hold you accountable for the things that you were told, the things that you know. And again, as I said last time too, this does not concern you as a preacher of the gospel. You preach the gospel as you feel led to preach the gospel to people. This, that's not your fault. Like if you preach the gospel to somebody and then they reject it after having grown with you to a certain extent. A lot of people, for instance, has, that's happened with this church a lot. And it will continue to happen to this church a lot. Lots of people will continue, continue with us for a while, and then they will stop and they will fall away. The parable of the seed and the sower explains that very clearly. But that's not our fault because, oh, maybe I shouldn't have, like this is maybe some people's reasoning. Maybe I shouldn't have preached the gospel to them at all because it would have been better for them to have not heard. Or No, no, that's, that's their fault. <laughs> we want people to be saved. 
if someone hears the knowledge of Jesus, just because now they have less excuse for actually rejecting it because they've heard so much of the gospel, um, that's, that is the person's fault, not your fault for preaching. You go ahead and you preach. If they want to hear for a while and then, and then still reject the gospel, even after heard and the Holy Spirit having tried to convince them of it and ha- them having been convinced of the gospel to some extent, just not in a full assurance, and then reject it, that's, that's, on, that's on the person. That's on them. That's not on you as, as a preacher of the gospel. Uh, but that is the kind of person that this is talking about. Furthermore, um, if we read um, uh, this next verse, verse 21, it says, For it had been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn away from the holy commandment. You see, the gospel here is called the holy commandment because obviously that ties into the obedience of faith that, that we understand. It says, They have turned away from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Uh, in verse 22, But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned uh, to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Um, that's actually... He's quoting a proverb, and I, I will read you the proverb. You don't have to go here, uh, Ms. Maris. Uh, I, I'll just read it. Proverbs 26, 11 is, is the reference that he's quoting, and it says, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. And so he's comparing this person to a dog returning to his vomit. Now, I don't know the biblical definition of the word vomit, as funny as that may sound, but I do know the biblical definition of the word dog. You can go to reforminus.com slash glossary and see all the uh, biblical proof for the word dog. But uh, you can throw this up there, Job 30, verse 1. Uh, Job 30, verse 1. And I'm going to read this out of the New King James Version. Job 30, verse 1. The word dog means a fool. And so basically, this is what he's saying in this passage. In this passage, right, he's very clearly referring to someone who it says, escape those who live in error. So they left the error of the world behind for the sake of the knowledge of Jesus. That's great. That's a, that's a good start, I should say, right? They, they started well, and, and they began well but they don't continue. It says they are entangled in that error again because there are deceivers out in the world and they hear their word and they go back and are entangled in the unbelief of this world again. So therefore, he says, well, they're like a dog returning to its vomit. What does that mean? Well, dog means fool. And the vomit here is referring to folly. I don't know in what way, but it is. So he just says, well, see, they're a fool that has returned to their folly. But this is not talking about a Christian returning to his folly. And furthermore, this is not talking about, you know, sinful actions. This, is ve- this, this must be very clear to us, okay? This, I have to make this very clear. A fool returning to his folly here is not talking about someone that started to get to know Jesus and give, quote-unquote, their life to him, and then returns and starts sinning again. That's not what this is talking about. Clearly, what this is, what the folly that this is talking about here is the error of the world. What had they escaped initially? The error of the world. The error, the misinformation that's in this world, the unbelief that's in this world. And then it says, like a dog returns to his vomit, that person who is still a fool, despite the fact that they have begun in the knowledge of Jesus and in that way escape those who live in error because they have some knowledge of Jesus, they are still a fool because they have not come to the full assurance of faith. So he said, this fool, literally, it's called this person a fool. And anyone that rejects the gospel knowingly or willfully, of course, is a fool. That word should be reserved for no one else except for someone who has known the gospel, has opportunity to receive it, and then says, no, thank you. There's not a better word for it than a fool. Even though God loves every fool in this world, that is, the, that is the pinnacle of foolishness. To hear the love of God, the gift of God, and the salvation, and all the benefit that Jesus came to bring you, and to be told of a God that loves you so much and say, nah, I'm good. That, 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 that is the epitome of, of folly. But that is the folly that this, it's referring to that this person returns to. It's talking about unbelief here. Okay, uh, this is not referring to like, oh, it's someone who, who started getting to know Jesus and then they start sinning again. No, no, no. If you start sinning, uh, even to say start sinning, especially for a person that's still coming to salvation, you're sinning all the time. Believer, even as believers, we do things that are wrong, I'm sure fairly regularly, depending on where our mind renewal is at. But especially for someone that's coming to salvation, you're still sinning the whole time you're getting to know Jesus. You know, again, I'm, this is applicable to a Christian to some extent, depending on your mind renewal, let alone someone who's not saved yet and is just escaping those who live in error. And again, like the parable of the seed and the sower. They do receive the word of God. They haven't born fruit to perfection yet. They're just tasting of the knowledge, right? They're just tasting of the power of the age to come. They're tasting of that salvation. 
and especially for that person, they never really stop sinning. They're, they're continuing to sin. Just because maybe, you know, you, you start seeing somebody and, oh, I saw them drinking or drugging, or I saw them with this woman, or I saw them with... Okay, but that doesn't save you or condemn you because you sin. Sin doesn't save or condemn you. You're not saved because you stop sinning, right? God forbid, none of us would be saved if that were the case. And you're not condemned because you start sinning more. This is not returning. This verse, I see a dog returns to his vomit. It's like people will use that, for instance, for someone that, let's say they've been sober for 12 years. Oh, yeah, I've been sober for 12 years. I gave my life to Jesus, and I'm living for him now. We got more to say about that, obviously. I'm sure everyone here does as well. But I've been sober for 12 years, and okay, and so like you're quote, unquote, I've given my life to Jesus, and then, and then oh, I start drinking again. Oh, you know, I'm like a dog returned to my vomit. No, 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 no. No, no. A dog returning to his vomit is referring to someone who has begun faith in Jesus and then returns to the error that they came from, the unbelief they came from. This is not referring to you starting to sin more. If, if you believe in Jesus and you're not saved and you start sinning I'll, like more than usual or something, okay, sin doesn't hinder your growth in your knowledge. Continue to grow in your knowledge. That, that, that's probably a pretty good point to just dwell on just for a quick second, even in the parable of the seed and the sower. Or for a believer, even for that matter, which the parable of the seed and the sower is not talking about believers, except that last, so, that last soil. But for a believer or a non-believer, if you're growing your knowledge of Jesus and you do something wrong, that doesn't hinder your knowledge. You know what hinders your knowledge? Other knowledge. Unbelief. Anything that would distract you from the knowledge of Jesus, that hinders someone's knowledge, not because you did something wrong. Okay, so a fool returning to his folly here is not referring to sinful actions. This is referring to error. According to this, the, the, the passage itself in 2 in, in uh, Peter, it's talking about error. And that's why he says a dog returns to its vomit like a fool returns to its folly because the word dog in the Bible means a fool, someone who is silly in their thinking. Uh, and that's why you'll see here, it says, but now, look, look, pay close attention to this here. This is uh, one of the, a, a good verse to define the word dog in the Bible. Uh, it says, they mock at me. This is Job speaking, I think. It says, now they mock at me, men younger than I, whose fathers I disdain to put with the dogs of my flock. So it's talking about young men here that are making fun of Job. Job says, young men mock me. And it says, the fathers, see, whose fathers I disdained, uh, to put with the dogs of my flock. So what he actually says here is, the fathers of these young men, this may not make sense in context, but that's okay, just look at the verse itself. It says, the, the, the fathers of these young men, he said, I would put with the dogs of my flock. So I classify their fathers of these young men with the dogs. Then in verse 8, switch to verse 8. Verse 8, speaking about these same young men, what did he say about their, their fathers? He said their fathers are like the dogs. And yet he says here, they were sons of fools. Yes, sons of vile men. You see that? He changes it. Instead of saying, he explains actually what he meant initially in Job 30, verse 1. He says, you know, I would put their fathers with the dog of, dogs of my flock. And then in verse 8 he says, they are sons of fools. Instead of sons of dogs, <laughs> that's kind of funny. I, I won't go, go any further into that. I'm sure everyone kind of understood that one. Sons of dogs in the Bible, not where you might hear this, you know, on TV, in the Bible is actually referring to a son of a fool. Um, it, it, it's not meant with the same uh, intensity that uh, you might hear on a TV or on a movie or something like that. Anyhow, that's what the word dog means. So uh, just, just, to, just to kind of wrap this up here, um, in, again, in 2 Peter chapter 2, in verse 22, uh, again, King James Version here, this is why when he says the dog returns to his vomit as a so returns, uh, uh, sorry, so that was washed to her wallowing in the mire or wallowing in the mud. Uh, this is referring to a person that has started to believe and then falls away to the disbelief that they came from. Um, all this should make perfect sense because we have perfect evidence of this in that parable. This, this should make total sense. 
two out of the four kinds of ground in that parable, they receive the word of God. And what does that mean? They have the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They have that knowledge. But those two types of ground, because of persecutions, because of cares of this life, because of the deceitfulness of riches and the deceitfulness of the things in this world. Notice that even, right? The deceitfulness of riches. It's not even because they have money. It's because they are deceived by their riches. You see, even in that case, it's not saying uh, uh, just merely money. Or, or, or it, it, it's about deceit. It's about unbelief. The, the deceitfulness of riches is simply talking about someone that looks at riches and says, you know, I have a reason to be confident because I'm rich. Or, or, or I'm chasing after wealth because uh, I, I want security. That is unbelief. So it's not about being wealthy. It's about the deceit of the riches. And people can be deceived by riches. But guess what? You can be deceived by pretty much anything. And if you are deceived in any such way from the knowledge of Jesus, it doesn't matter what it is. It matters what it's pulling you away from. You understand? Like, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be sin. Let's say someone is chasing after sin, and they want to go out there, and they want to sleep with everybody, and they want to, you know, whatever. They want to drink and drug, and they want to do all the stuff that everybody classifies as, oh, yep, that's sin. It's not sin that hinders your progress in your knowledge of Jesus. But if you use anything, including sin, but it doesn't matter what it is, if you trade the knowledge of Jesus, right, or as Romans 1 says, if you suppress the truth with even unrighteousness, in other words, if you chase unrighteous actions, and in so doing, you trade the truth of God and say, you know what, no, I don't want to know Jesus because I would rather sin, for instance, right? The sin is not what's hindering your progress. It's the deceitfulness of it. It's the fact that you suppressed the truth. That's the point. But I could have a, a new puppy, right? And I can get a new puppy, and oh my gosh, I'm so enthralled with the new puppy. And I say, you know what? As silly as this may sound, I'm devoting all my time to this new puppy, and this is my life, and this is, you know, the, I, I found my purpose in life is to take care of puppies. I will still be, I will still fall away from the truth equally. If, if you trade the truth of God for anything, it doesn't matter. Again, the reason why I use the puppy example is because it's the thing that we would never think would be any, there would any be, be any problem with it whatsoever. But there's not a problem with puppies, right? There's a problem with suppressing the truth. And if you use puppies to suppress the truth because of your love of puppies, then it doesn't matter. It, 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 it's like a kind of idolatry. Anything that you trade the truth for it, if someone were, I'm not talking about a Christian that sins. I'm not talking about even just a, an unbeliever that sins. I'm talking about some, if you trade the truth for anything, it could, be, it could be sin, it could be puppies, it could be, it could be your devotion to working around the church. And you say, you know what, I'm so focused on working around the church that I just, I've, I've forgotten Jesus entirely. It doesn't matter what it is. It's the knowledge of the truth that is important and that saves a person. And therefore, anything that drags a person away or causes a person to reject the knowledge of the truth is obviously going to hinder someone's growth and ultimately for an unbeliever like this, it's obviously going to result in them never being saved. Not because of the thing itself or because of there's an action that they did that hindered them or because there's that particular thing or like I said even before, or like even the riches themselves is what drug them away. No, it's deceit. If, you can, if you're deceived by anything away from the knowledge of Jesus, you see, because it's the knowledge of Jesus that saves. If someone is deceived from that knowledge in any such way, that's what hinders people's progress and that's what hinders people from coming to salvation. It doesn't matter what it is. And that's why I would, I would, I would direct you to Romans chapter 1 to read Romans chapter 1 and also the beginning of Romans chapter 2 because you'll see what I'm talking about. It does talk about people, whether people like this or not. I know it's not politically correct to say today and I'm just going to stop here. But um, it talks about homosexuality there. It talks about you know, sexual immorality in general there. And what it says is that these people, uh, when, when, when you read that on, on, for face value, sometimes people look at that and say, oh, see, these people aren't saved because you know, they practice homosexuality or they, they, they practice sexual immorality or some perversion of, of sexual activity in, in, in general. No, 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 that's, that's not why they're not saved. Listen, no person in this room right now is sexually pure of their own works. No one is, myself included. No one is here, not a single person. A person cannot be pure of their own works. It's not their sexual immorality or some perversion. Every person in here has perverted sexual activity or in your mind you have. Every person, including myself, every single person has here. There's no exception to that. It's not sexual immorality that hinders someone from the kingdom of God. Jesus came to save us from that. Jesus is our answer, and renewing our mind to Jesus is our answer to that. Okay? 
But here's the, here's the important point. The reason why it explains that these people will come into judgment in the last day is not because of their immorality, it's because if you notice in Romans chapter 1, it says they suppress the truth with their unrighteousness. If you want to chase after pleasures of this world, sinful pleasures in this world, instead of the truth, that'll kill you. Not because of the thing itself, not because sin hinders people from entering the kingdom of God, but because suppressing the truth in any way, whether that's with your unrighteous actions or whether that's with your love of puppies. It doesn't matter what it is. If you suppress the truth, if you because suppress, I mean like push it down, right? If you push down the truth that the Holy Spirit's trying to teach you, and you say, no, 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 because that's the kind of person this is talking about. I push the truth down. I don't want to know this because I want to continue in the pleasures that I'm enjoying right now. That pleasure could be anything. It doesn't matter. Whatever pulls a man's heart away from the knowledge of Jesus is what will kill the man. And it just doesn't matter what it is. So it's not homosexuality, it's not sexual immorality or any perversion of sexual activity in any, in any way, shape, or form that hinders someone from the kingdom. It is always something that suppresses the truth because it's the truth that saves a person. And if you suppress that truth with anything, that is what is going to kill a person. And that's the only thing uh, that can, right? So anyway, a dog returning to his vomit here First of all, it's not talking about a Christian. should never, ever be applied to a Christian because a dog means a fool, and a believer is never called a fool in the Bible. That is the truth. And furthermore, the folly that even this unbeliever or this fool is returning to is not referring to sinful actions or something like that because that would have not hindered them from entering the kingdom. Sin doesn't hinder people from entering the kingdom or from being saved. It's only folly and things that suppress the truth that do so, and that's the folly that this person has returned to in the error. It's talking about unbelief in this world, and that's why this person is, is portrayed as someone who never gets saved, okay, for that reason, because they return to the error and unbelief of the world that they had left previously. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reform Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this unpopular message to the world. If you'd like to support Reform Church, you can do so at reforminus.com slash give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reforminus.com.